Welcome to The Extra Dimension. This episode is on the topic of encryption, featuring Ryan Rampersad and Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED9. All right, so full disclosure here, you're about to learn about encryption from a guy who got a C in cryptography class in college. Uh, what the, what I like to say about that class is that I learned just enough to know that I never ever want to do cryptography in my life. How about you, Ryan? What did what do you know about the subject? Well, I mean, I I don't know a lot of the technical bits, but I uh, I didn't take a class. Although I've you know just like everyone who has made any web service, you you have to dabble in a little bit of encryption mm-hmm. to uh, to make a secure product. Or at least, at least know when something is encrypted versus when it's not in order to have everything function properly, right? And, and also the way to do it and when to use something versus something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the way that this episode is going to be structured is we're going to go over kind of the basics of encryption first, uh, so that you have a foundational knowledge of it. Then we're going to go into a few specific types of encryption and kind of a little bit of the technical stuff about of how those work. And, and then we'll finish off with why we're talking about this right now. Why did we make this episode on February 21st, 2016 specifically? Because um, there, there's actually... There's a reason. There is a reason, yes. There's... Um, something happened, you know, that I, I saw Ryan tweeting about a bunch and I was like, hey, that would be a great, great topic for, for an extra dimension. Mm-hmm. All right, so encryption. Uh, what is encryption? Uh, at its most basic, encryption is taking some sort of message, some data, and scrambling it up so that only the authorized people can read it, right? Mm-hmm. And there are various ways to do that. Um, a lot of times it involves taking some secret and using that as the scrambling agent, mm-hmm. right? Um, so if we're, if we're thinking about like doing encryption by hand, you might take um, the the text of the message that you're going to be sending and take some secret passphrase. And based on that passphrase, so, you know, uh, I think I, I think the Caesar cipher is the one where you have, like, um, say my my passphrase is peach. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, would, you would take the first letter of your message and shift it down the alphabet by P letters. Right. So whatever, however far down the alphabet P is, you would add that to the number that the first letter, like, so let's say, hey, hello world is our message. We're going to take H and we're going to shift it down by that many letters, right? Right. And then the second letter, which is E, is going to be shifted down by however many letters it E is. Well, E and E because, is happening. Uh, I, I picked some bad examples, didn't I, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's hard to do encryption just, you know in the air yeah um but you can okay but so so e is an easy example because that's five letters into the alphabet right right so you would take the e from hello world and shift that down the alphabet by five places Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. yeah um and so then once you're done you have this this message that seems like complete gibberish and uh the only people who will be able to read it are the people who know that peach was the word that we scrambled it with, right? And so why is encryption useful? What is that? Yeah, so encryption is important uh, in kind of two different categories, right? Mm-hmm. There's encryption while while communicating something, while it's, it's in transit, mm-hmm. and then there's encryption on permanent storage. Okay. Um, so in the, in the communications area, um, encryption is important because others, for, for one thing, others cannot read what what is being sent while it's in in transit um for obvious reasons they can't read it um but they also can't alter the contents of a message which is something that is not immediately obvious right um and the reason that they cannot alter the contents of a message is because unless they have the key for unscrambling the message they won't be able to change the message itself because if they try to change a scrambled message then when the person on the other end tries to unscramble the message, it's going to look like gibberish still. And they're going to be like, this is, there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Um, And so encryption does take a little bit of work, right? It takes a bit of CPU power. Right. Um, There's computation involved. Yeah, exactly. So in a perfect world where we could trust everybody, it it would be much simpler to just not encrypt anything, right? Right. Um, And so because of that, in, at, at least in the early days of the internet and, to some extent still now 
the only things that got encrypted were the important things that we didn't want other people to read. So when mm-hmm. you are transmitting your credit card information uh, or your password or you know whatever to to a server, um, that stuff would obviously get encrypted. And they make sure to to tell you always that oh yeah, this is being encrypted with SSL, and you don't need to worry about um, SSL, SLL, SSL. SSL. Yeah, yes. I got it right. Good. Um, so yeah, and but but the problem with that is if we only encrypt the stuff that's important, then the fact that it's encrypted is going to be kind of a flag, right? Mm-hmm. So people who are looking for important things to go and attack are going to be like, oh, that's encrypted. I'm going to focus my energy on figuring out what that is. Mm-hmm. Whereas unencrypted messages are, are uninteresting, right. right? So what we really need to do is we need to get ourselves to a world where everything that's being sent over the internet is encrypted. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's actually, there's been some progress on that area uh, because I, I believe it's a lot cheaper to get certificates yeah, for so HTTPS, right? Recently, there's been uh, you know a lot of work so Firefox made this really great thing a few years ago where uh, in in Firefox there was more modern support for newer types of stronger certificates. Uh, that, that started with Firefox. I believe the EFF was involved in helping that spread to other browsers. Okay. And then more recently we've gotten something called Let's Encrypt, and it's a service that lets you generate your own certificate that is known to work everywhere for mm-hmm. the most part. And while it isn't, it, while it is free, there's some technical things about it that might be annoying. Although it is a fully fledged, ready to go certificate. Okay. And you know, you, you've probably seen in Chrome or in Firefox, and maybe even Internet Explorer if they even care, uh, a little thing that's probably somewhere. It's either a padlock or a green box around your URL or something that says that this web page is going through an encrypted connection. Yep. And there are providers that provide that encryption. So how do we know that this host and this connection is who we say we are? Well, you might have very sign signing it. You might have thwart signing it. You might have some agent that is trustworthy backing that assurance. Mm-hmm. And Let's Encrypt apparently is doing that with a, they they want to become their own authority, but currently mm-hmm. they're not. They're using um, somebody else's authority to back their authority. Okay. So we're 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 getting there. Uh, it's it's getting easier and easier. It's not effortless yet, but it's getting there. Yeah, because if it was effortless, then uh, people listening to this would have visited the Nexus TV and would have seen a little green padlock. Right, exactly. So this this message might be edited by the NSA later today that says you're safe and you're not. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, very good. Uh, fortunately, the format that we're transmitting this via is a, a little bit more difficult to fake. Because it's a human voice in a recording, and it's going to be very difficult for some middle man in the middle attack to alter an MP3 file on the fly very quickly and make it believable. Well, don't don't pass it off. The NSA can do it. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. They have their top men. Um, yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, you know what? What if they have like some evil clones of you and I, just you know, in a, in a just tube? waiting. Yeah, exactly. It, waiting in a studio with their headphones on, and uh, okay, now we got them impersonating them, everyone. Now I get yep. going. Yeah, that, that would not be fun for anybody. No. Um. Yeah. So, so that's encryption during communication. Uh. It, can you think of any any other really important points to put on that subject? So encryption commu- during communication. Uh, you know, there's uh cable. If you've ever watched cable, you don't think about cable as communicating, but uh, mm-hmm. when a cable provider sends the signal from their office to your house, that content is literally encrypted over the line, so that a non-authorized person can't tap into the your cable line and get free cable. Right. And so that's sort of encryption, although it's not really working between two people. It's working sort of between two devices. And mm-hmm. it's not quite as direct as something like SSL might be. Oh, yeah. And I mean, a lot of times uh, encryption is not between two people. It's right. it's just your it's computer assuring even, you that... But it's not. It, but it, in that case, it's not even an assurance. It's really just preventing somebody from doing something else. Yeah. 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 I'm sure there are other examples of it. I just can't think of them. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's encryption in permanent storage. Um, so let's say that you have your, your nice desktop, right? And you've I got, do. you've got five hard drives in I it. I don't. Uh, okay. So that was a I few want, too many. I, but... want, I want those hard drives. 
Hand them over. I mean, I I have three hard drives. How many? Man, you're rich. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, it was an investment. Um, but anyway, so so I've got so I've got several hard drives, right? And when I when I delete something from one of those hard drives, it isn't actually like deleted deleted. Mm-hmm. It is the operating system marks that section of the hard drive as deleted and says, okay, if I if I need to use that space to write something else, it's free. Um, it's free to use. And why uh, does the har- operating system do that? Because it would take more effort to actually write some more stuff on top of it right uh so right correct <laughs> sure uh so so yeah that's that's one of the reasons that it that it doesn't do that just to because it's it's a resource it's, mm-hmm. it's time and effort um and and it does it, computers are all about efficiency right and i love that mm-hmm. um so so if you have your old hard drive that you want to like give away to somebody else or, or throw away because it's not working anymore or whatever um it, chances are it's going to be actually readable by somebody else. If they decided to pick it up out of the trash uh, and and try and read your personal information, I have no idea what you have on your hard drive, but you know they might be able to figure it out. Um, and so encryption would be one way to protect from that from that uh, happening. Um, so it would take all of the contents of your hard drive and scramble them up according to whatever password you've given it. Um, and... The other, the other way to protect from that would be before you uh, throw away a hard drive or a device or whatever, uh, have it format the whole thing, you know, so it's writing a bunch of random random data over the entire drive, which takes a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, now, the fact is that, like, most operating systems, at least desktop operating systems, don't encrypt things by default. No. You would think that it would be pretty simple for like you know i have i have my account on windows i have created a password for that windows account just encrypt the data the the user data you don't even need to encrypt like the windows operating system itself necessarily but like encrypt my user data with my password pretty simple right um but that's that's not built into many and I can think of a lot of technical reasons why you wouldn't want that you wouldn't want that no okay. no no you would not want that I trust you. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want that. Okay. Um, so wishful thinking on my part. Um, but yeah, so so even even though it's it's possible to prevent other people from reading your stuff once you, when you're throwing away a drive, uh, that's not going to prevent them from reading the drive if you don't have time to do that when they take it away from you by force because they just busted into your house. These right? are totally not computers. These <laughs> oh, man. References to the core will never get old. So, you know, you can format a drive. That's great. Mm -hmm. You can stripe a drive. You can magnetically fry a drive. You can microwave a drive. uh, Toaster a drive. You can do a lot of things to make a drive not readable anymore. And so that's what I would recommend. If you really want to get rid of a drive, you have to literally just destroy it. Mm -hmm. Um, You you can try wiping it and formatting it all you want. but I remember watching a video that Google put out of, like, what they do to the drives in their data centers when they're retiring them. Yeah. And it's quite something Mm -hmm. they yeah they format them and then they like put them through this giant crusher masher thing i mean that's the only way to be sure yeah um now the fact that windows doesn't encrypt things by default it has been a pretty good quote-unquote feature for me personally Mm -hmm. because my parents don't back up anything and so inevitably when i when their computer has like some sort of catastrophic failure and i need to reinstall windows onto it uh i can grab their hard drive take it over to my house Mm -hmm. first uh take a look at their hard drive through my computer grab any important files off of it and uh and then go and format it and, and reinstall windows and everything um and so then we don't lose any of those family photos or whatever. And you can imagine why something as simple as Windows itself doesn't come with encryption on by default. Because how many people lose their passwords to their computer? How many people oh, just, goodness. Just, just can't handle simple things like that? You know, you know, if a person loses access to their email but they never use their email, it's fine. But their computer might actually have maybe a little bit more importance to their lives. Mm-hmm. Even if they still have no clue how to use it efficiently. So... There's a lot of good reasons, and there's a lot of technical reasons, too. Yeah. Um, now, of course, there are, like, third-party oh, yeah. encryption tools. Um, yeah, even first-party encryption tools for Windows. Yeah. Uh, like if BitLocker. You, yeah, if you get the professional or, or enterprise mm-hmm. version of Windows or whatever. Um, 
And in the case of mobile devices, uh, actually, in today's world, it usually encryption comes pre-installed at, at least as an option, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so on Android, uh, uh, as of, I think, what, 5.0, right, Lollipop? Yeah. Um, they, they shipped... Uh, encryption as an option on the Nexus Six, it came with encryption by default on, mm-hmm. and everybody hated it. Um, so yeah, it depends device by device whether or not it it will happen as soon as you start up the 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 phone mm-hmm. and put in your your little pattern right. for the first time. And so, I guess I don't want to describe it during the show. We can talk about it later if you want. But the way that the phone encryption works is that there's always sort of a password, but you and you mm-hmm. add your own password to the phone's own password okay because it's always technically encrypted but you just change the key when you add your key right okay yeah um and then on ios uh i think as of the 5s i don't know for sure they they shipped encryption or no 5s was when they introduced the secure enclave uh, enclave, yeah um but anyway yeah on ios for some time uh encryption has been on by default mm-hmm. on their devices. Um, so that's nice because if, if you think about it, uh, you're much less likely to accidentally misplace your desktop or your laptop. Whereas with a phone, it's very easy to accidentally leave that at the coffee shop. Exactly. So, And now, just because you have a device that's encrypted doesn't mean it's technically secured. Mm-hmm. Because if your password to your encrypted device is 1234... That's not going to be too hard to it's guess. It's not going to be hard to guess. Yeah. So... Just because you have encryption doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. And and also, like, uh, since we live in a connected world, of course, uh, your own device, is, chances are, is not the only place where that data is going to be stored. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you'll, you'll have some sort of backup on uh, a company's server somewhere. And, the, you know, it, it's, it's always a big uh, concern of people's about whether or not that data is being securely stored right. because we don't have direct control over how Google, Apple, Amazon, etc., cetera, uh, store our own files. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so there's, there, there's been a lot of scrutiny, um, you know, when, whenever there's some sort of snafu and, and personal data gets leaked, Apple has to, you know, immediately go, well, okay, there, there wasn't actually a problem with our system somebody just got access to this celebrity's password Mm -hmm. and then they were able to access all their stuff as if they were that person right um and uh so yeah so the the basics is is that anytime that a company is storing somebody's personal information it should absolutely be encrypted right Right. definitely Um, hopefully with that the the password that that person created for that account Mm -hmm. right um so that even no even that company itself Nobody at that company can can and go and access that thing. Ideally, that's what you want. Now, let's think about something like Google Drive, for example. Mm-hmm. So, is your document that you just made now for this show in Google Drive encrypted? Uh, should be. Pretty sure it is. How do you know it is? Uh, I don't know for sure. I, I know that me viewing it right now in the web browser is encrypted. It's protected by HTTPS. The connection's encrypted. Yes. But was the document on their server encrypted? Uh, I would have to do some more research on how Google Drive stores things. Well, so let's pretend it was encrypted by them and it was stored on their server. Mm-hmm. They have the keys then. And so they could be asked mm-hmm. for the keys and then it could be decrypted. Yes. And since it wasn't, you didn't, you weren't prompted for a key when you opened the document presumably they have those keys because yeah you un- weren't. unless it's using the password that i provided for this session which would be know, funny kind of though because we both have access to it yeah so then it would uh yeah is mm, yeah mm, mm, mm. so there's there's just when you start offering this encryption in a connected way it becomes incredibly difficult to make things useful and user friendly yeah at the same time as being secure so you have freedoms and you have security and you have to have a balance between that so one of the things that comes to mind is dropbox Mm-hmm. So Dropbox has, you know, a lot of features where you, you can upload something, and then if you want it later, you can download that individual file. Right. And uh, presumably it's all encrypted on Dropbox's servers. But you can also get um, file names leaking out. So file names aren't encrypted, although the contents on the servers are encrypted. And then uh, for Dropbox, they do deduplication. So e- if a file, while encrypted, has the same key or the the same uh, like hash as another file or you know they're identical they won't take up twice as much space so they'll just keep one copy oh that's fascinating so just because something's encrypted again just mean it's uh good right 
And didn't does Dropbox actually have their own servers, or do they store things on S3? I think. Oh, is what I, they I feel like they probably have their own servers. They're, okay, they're big enough for that. Okay, they'd be paying a fortune through S3. <laughs> um. All right. So yeah. So those. That's uh, kind of the basics of encryption. Let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Oh man. Details. You want to talk about details? Yes. Yeah. You like details, don't you? Well, I like I like it when you talk about okay, details. Okay. Well, so first uh, we have to mention our good friend Andrew Bailey, who made this wonderful article in a format that you are familiar with. Yes. So uh, if anybody who reads uh, XKCD um, probably saw in the past when when uh, Randall Monroe made a comic explaining how the Saturn V rocket worked, um, but he only used the most commonly, the most frequently used uh, were 1,000 words in the English language. And that uh, that comic was called Upgoer 5. And... Uh, then he then he took that concept and made a whole book out of it of of uh, the XKCD explainer or something like that, mm-hmm. um, explaining how a lot of like complex scientific things uh, work. And I actually I, I've seen a copy of the book. Um, my old roommate Declan has one, mm. and so I was flipping through it last time I was at his house. That's good. And I, I want one of my own. Um, but so Andrew Bailey decided to take this concept of of explaining things using only the one thousand most commonly used words. And apply that to encryption, and it and it actually turns out to be pretty pretty good, pretty decent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very thorough, in fact. And um, I kind of use some of the terminology from that I, here. I like that the, the yeah the title is hidden writing. Yeah, yeah if that's if that's mm-hmm. what it is. That makes sense. So let's begin uh, with no key encryption. Okay. And so this concept is somewhat complicated for people to grasp. But imagine you didn't have to supply anything other than the data you're encrypting. No key, no no to, no 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 other th- to stuff. Just just the data. Yeah. Okay. My entire concept of encryption is breaking down now. Yeah. Save so, me. So here here's what this is useful for first. So let's say you wanted to verify some data was in fact the data you were expecting. Okay. So I sent you an email, and you want to know this is the email I sent you. Or or more likely, I'm on a website downloading an EXE, oh, sure. and I want to make sure that an that's... EXE? Yeah, I love that. Man, you're living dangerously. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's say you're on a website then, downloading an EXE, and you click the big button that says download, and right next to it, it has a little string of characters. It might be labeled MD5 or SHA-1, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter. So what you can do is you can use a program uh, that can generate, based on that file, a string of characters, and hopefully... The string of characters you get when you do that matches the one the website has provided for you. Mm-hmm. And if they match, you have verified the integrity of the file. Yep. Assuming that the website itself hasn't been compromised. That's and, true. You know. <laughs> Hopefully it was served with SSL. Yeah. Right. Man, it's just a, just a layer. It's, 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 all, it's layers all the way down, right. just like turtles. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah turtles. So, so that's integrity. So that's one thing. It's very important for integrity to be something. So that's kind of like a checksum. Uh, you know, you can verify the integrity with simpler alg- algorithms too. So, if you had packets, you could verify that packets were sent in a certain order. Oh yeah. And with the right bits in the right places, maybe not with a hashing algorithm, but with something simpler. You know, just making sure that all the bits in some row add up to one and all the bits in another row add up to two. And that's very important for cases where, like, um, I I have uh, a game that I've downloaded from Steam, and games tend to be rather large, mm-hmm. um, and I want to verify that, you know, the, the game files themselves haven't been corrupted in some way. So uh, Steam wouldn't have to, like, re upload or download the, the whole entire thing. thing to make sure it can that do it in it's smaller pieces exactly yeah and that's much faster much more efficient so that's integrity and so that's really useful but verification is another idea and this goes back to the email so how do you know the email i sent you is actually the email i sent you so what you do is you copy the whole email i message you in hangouts to find yeah, out okay sure <laughs> But let's there's a, remember there's an evil imposter Ryan at the NSA headquarters. Oh yeah, right, right. And so maybe what you could do is you could copy my entire message and put it into this hashing function and if the hash is what I supplied with the email and it matches with your output, then you know that email was in fact not edited by me or as you pointed out, maybe the hash was also compromised. Mm-hmm. But at least you know that the verification of that thing exists. So another thing you might also do with a hash is you might use it to not store a password. 
Okay. And so this is what ah, this is traditionally what I'm familiar with. So let's say you had a password to a website, and mm-hmm. there's another million people who also have passwords on that website. Yep. And somehow, by accident, the database gets leaked. Oops. That would be bad. A million passwords just ready to go. Well, instead of storing them all in plain text, I know your password is bulkbag21, and instead of storing that in plain text, you could instead have that encoded somehow, and a hash is a great way to do that. And the reason that's useful is because there's no way to reverse a hash. Yeah. There's no way to reverse no key encryption. It's it's a one-way... Once the data goes in, it doesn't come out the same way again. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And so... There's uh, been quite a bit of uh, you know time since encryption in this style has existed. It you know it sort of started with MD5 when it was popular, then it shifted to SHA-1, and then it's now there's new stuff. There's bcrypt and the next one, which is argon two. I don't know what happened to argon one. It's it must have sunk. I guess so. Cause... I don't. I don't. I don't really know how it works. So here here's how these um, password hashing functions work so usually there's uh there's a string of characters and it's just like any sha1 or md5 hash that works just like normal but it's uh delimited by little dollar signs okay and it has a version number in it that will contain not only the version number but which algorithm actually made this string Mm -hmm. so if it was bcrypt or if it was argon2 or if it was some other function you could determine it by just looking at the version number string okay then it comes with a cost value. And this is where it's really interesting. So a cost value is really important now because computers are getting faster and faster every year, allegedly. Sure. Um, and I hope so. Hopes, hopefully. <laughs> and so one of the things that everybody noticed about SHA-1 is that, well, great, now we have SHA-1, but we know in 10 years we're going to need SHA-2. Right. Just, no. And now because we, it won't be, it will be more trivial to be able to brute force SHA-1 yeah, in right. the future. As yeah. time goes on, even if the thing has no weaknesses internally as an algorithm, it'll just be faster to brute force. Yes. And the the probability of having a, an algorithm that has no weaknesses, no vulnerabilities, is uh, pretty low. It, it is low, although it isn't so low that it isn't impossible. Mm-hmm. But it's more possible at, over time just to brute force it and just don't even worry about the weaknesses. Yeah. And so, yes, you can, you, know, you can go to SHA-256, SHA-512, just keep adding the key size up and up and up. But instead, we could add a cost factor. And the reason this is useful is over time, you know, this year is 2016, we can have a sh- cost factor of 10. It'll take some arbitrary time times 10, and this is usually measured in milliseconds, for each function to run. Okay. So if I was, you know, hashing your password bulk bag 21 uh-huh. it would take you know 50 milliseconds to run okay this year next year it might take 65 because we've upped the cost factor by one the year after that it could take 85 and at, over time we can increase the computational intensity of these functions the hashes change because the function internally has changed but we can just store the new one if you've provided an authenticator okay and so this is okay. useful as long as we can keep increasing it as uh, you know, performance goes up and up. So does that mean that you have to continually take the stored things and rehash them using the with yeah, the new over time. cost value? Right. Okay, okay, and that's fine because if a user can authenticate with the password that is provided, we know it matches because they got in. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And so that's traditionally what we do. And then we also accompany all that stuff, the cost factor, with a salt. And so you might have a you know, your password, but you also might have an application level salt and a row level salt. And the row level salt is what this is. And that means instead of just having bulk bag 21 as your password, you might also a prepend or append, you know, some other string of mm-hmm. gibberishy characters. And all of that's done just by the hash function itself. You don't have to do any other work. It, that's all taken care of it in itself now. Mm-hmm. In the old days, you had to do all that stuff manually if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. You know, you would have had to, you know, run SHA-1 25 times or some arbitrary number of times. Okay. And so this is really great. And, uh, you know, everybody uses password passing or hash word, hash word? Password hashing now. <laughs> it, it should be industry standard, although you hear of companies every other week, oh, my database was hacked. Oh, no, all the passwords are out. Uh, you heard about the big Homeland Security thing where... All their passwords and information was leaked. Did I hear about this? Oh, maybe it wasn't Homeland Security, but it was some United States uh, 
deal. Okay. So so that that's the easiest one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we're gonna go to one key. Okay. Encryption. So we're we're upping the keys by one. Yeah. So we started at zero in traditional computer science ways, uh-huh. and now we got yep. to one, which okay. is really the second one. So normal people are gonna hate us. <laughs> I know. I already hate it. So this is bi-directional encryption. What that means to me, and hopefully to you, is that you give it a key, and then you have some encrypted thing. Mm-hmm. You give it a key again, and you have your decrypted thing. Yep. Same key. Same key both times. Yep. Why is that useful? Uh, that is useful because if I want to encrypt or decrypt stuff that only I should be able to see, uh, that is the simplest way to do it. It really is. I mean, it's the thing you would invent if you were inventing this. It's yeah. the most logical and effortless way. You pretty much did it earlier in this episode. You invented with the, the peach key and the hello as peach, world. and mm-hmm. you invented your your ciphertext as hello world. Mm-hmm. And so you just got to remember that the decrypting is subtracting instead of addition. Or you know, it's yeah. just whatever inverse operation. You know, it's, yeah, exactly. It depends on your algorithm, but right. Mm-hmm. So well, that's it's simple, it's obvious, it's very intuitive. It's also really fast usually. So yeah. it's much faster than these other things. And then the overhead is, you know, there's overhead, but it's lower than other alternatives. And unlike one, uh, no key hashing, you can reverse it. So it's, you know, actually encryption and mm-hmm. not sort of integrity verification. Yeah. So there's the general standard, which everybody pretty much uses, which is AES. Mm-hmm. I've heard and, of that. And uh, I think it's the American encryption standard. Oh, that's great. And, well, you know how it is. And uh, there was a one previously named for, it was DES, which was the data encryption standard, but apparently that was too weak. Is that the one that the NSA had uh, a lot of input on, on the standard? I think they've pretty much been involved in all of them. Okay, but the, there was there was uh, one some something from like the eighties or nineties where the NSA um, made sure that there were backdoors built into the standard, and then uh, people were like, "Well, that's bad. We're not going to use it." Uh, that might have been different. Okay, yeah. So this is a, a very complicated algorithm. It goes far beyond just shifting characters based on oh, yeah. uh, numeric position. The the first rule of cryptography, especially in computer science, is if you can do it by hand, it's not secure. No. So this this involves the level, you know, byte level manipulations in yep. matrix formats, and it, it's crazy stuff. Luckily, we're not mathematicians, so we can't actually try to give you any of those details. You can you can read a high level description here on the Wikipedia. It's it's very fascinating. And, you know, it, it involves adding a key, a bytes from the key to mm-hmm. the ciphertext, and then in, in, a, in a loop, subtracting bytes, shifting rows, mixing columns, adding more bytes, and then a final round of subtracting bytes, shifting rows, and adding more bytes. I think I have a notebook somewhere from that <laughs> semester where I was taking cryptography with, like, all these diagrams showing how these algorithms are supposed to work, and I don't understand it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you can also, if you're if you're really bored, um, go on to um, I think it's Computer File on the YouTube. They have a lot of great videos that describe quite a few of these things. Okay. So uh, other than AES and DES, which is no longer secure, I don't really know if there's any other popular, you know, bidirectional so, mm-hmm. one key algorithms. I don't. If there are, I have no idea what they are anymore, and. Uh, that's that's pretty exciting. So, wh- what applications use one or this bidirectional format? So, this would be something where you would use. Um, this is basically like SSL. Okay. SSL, you know, it has uh, a certificate backing it, but the password itself is probably in between somewhere. It's the tunnel itself, the packets are probably encoded with this format. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's easier for the client and the server to agree upon a key. After verification, which we'll talk about it later, mm-hmm. and then just channel the data through this bidirectional thing, one key on both sides. Okay. And then it's, uh, and the reason for that is because it's fast, it's easy. What else? Um, disk encryption for Windows or Linux or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's much easier just to use the same key on both sides. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, that implies there's a place where it's asymmetric. Each side is not equal. Wait, are you saying we're going to add another key? Yes. Whoa. We're going to have two key encryption. And this is also called public key encryption. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a little bit more complicated. But imagine you have your ciphertext, whatever you're trying to hide. And then you need to generate a key. But one key isn't good enough. So what you do is you make a thing not only that can generate one key, but two keys that are somehow 
related. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of think of this as the Einstein spooky action at a distance for encryption. Is this the one that has to do with large prime numbers being multiplied together into another? Large prime-ish kind of thing. Yeah, it's pretty much that. Uh, That is one implementation. There are other implementations, too. Uh, Kind of like uh, ecliptic key encryption. That's also related. Okay. And so when you can generate two numbers, two keys that are based off of one key, sort of, you can encrypt your message, your ciphertext, with the one key, Mm -hmm. and then you can decrypt it with the other. Yep. But what is very important is that having either key doesn't give you the other key. Yep. So, for example, if I knew Ian wanted to send me a message, I could send him a key, he could encrypt the message with his key, then he could send the message to me, and then I could decrypt it. Mm -hmm. But nobody else would be able to decrypt it, even though they got his key somehow. Yeah, so so the one that you sent me would be the public the, public key. Yeah, the encryptor. And the one that you Have, keep is the private key. Which is the decryptor. Yep. And there are... Is it reversible? Can you encrypt with your private key yep. and then somebody else decrypt with the public one? No. Nope, okay. But there are reasons to do that, actually. Okay. So if you had a private key, what you could do is you could sign something i Mm -hmm. guess and then you could verify that it is who they say they are if the public key somehow did something right right so this would be an alternative to hashing sort of and yeah but it's a more stringent version of hashing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now guess what there are no more keys we've run out oh there's no three key algorithms there's nothing that doesn't exist i mean two key algorithms blow my mind enough already so i'm glad that we had we get to stop there so the 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 most common two key algorithm pretty much is the rsa algorithm and let's see what does that stand for uh nobody knows so i think it was named after the people who invented it yeah it it is it's it's uh ron rivest eddie shamir and leonard eldman Mm -hmm. great stuff uh this algorithm's more even more complicated so you just you just go ahead and have fun reading all about that uh big numbers multiplied together a lot of times math so 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 ah there's actual math on the there there is modulus and stuff yeah so now with all of this encryption so when do you use what so uh let's go back to our ssl website kind of example so the initial connection the client probably sends a public key up to the server okay or is that right? Yeah, I think so. And then the server encrypts whatever it needs to send down to the client, mm-hmm. which is probably some identification information. It's like an initial handshake. Yep. And then the client, now that it has the you know comeback stuff, can decrypt it, and it says, "Great, I know who you are. I believe who you are." Does does in inside that message is there any? Uh, is there like another public key for the return handshake? No. So now what the what the client will do is it'll probably generate a new key and another new key. So the first key will be another public key mm-hmm. and it'll also generate a bidirectional one key. Okay. And then the then it will send the one key up using the public key again. Okay. And it should be getting the channel set up for cross-communication with the one key. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is useful is because it's much faster. When you use two-key encryption, it's slower, and it can only be uh, traditionally a smaller package. Right. Because it's slower, and Mm -hmm. and the overhead is much bigger. Yep. So then uh, you're good to go. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now, thinking about all of that makes me really, really thankful for all of the work that our computers do for us. And, you know, it's very complicated. Yeah. And I'm thankful to the uh, programmers who come up with all these things, because I don't understand them. I mean, it's not hard to understand. It's just hard to, it's hard to describe, but it's also harder to imagine it actually working. Yeah. <laughs> in in a way that is actually invulnerable. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's, there are many types of uh, attacks that, that. Uh, we can don't, be brought into the systems. You know, you have your side channel yeah. attacks, you have your leak data attacks. Man in the middle is one that man, I your, mentioned your, already. Yeah, your man yeah. in the middle, which is, you know, a great attack. There's yeah. Highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I, I love this, uh, this little note that you have down here at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> is encryption a munition? 
No. The answer is no. So uh, well, we have to talk about that. I think yeah. it's very important to because we're moving on from the technical parts to this alternative, the social parts, the reason, the, the political parts, yeah. right? And so in the nineties, and maybe a little bit before that, so middle eighties to the nineties, there was uh, basically a ban on sending any software from the United States to any other place because the government believed that encryption. Well, w- any software that included right encrypt or yeah cryptograph cryptographic. Uh, algorithms yeah Yeah. encryption they believe that this was a munition which apparently you can't ship out of the united states or something or export it in general Mm -hmm. and well so it turns out there was a really nice guy who decided to write a book literally he printed his c code in the book sold the book because that's protected under the first amendment Mm -hmm. and problem solved yeah but should do you think that encryption should be considered a munition no why i think encryption is a very important tool for all communication uh and since communication between and amongst nations is desirable uh yeah we should definitely allow that to be exported mm-hmm. so the one of the reasons for the ban on encryption leaving the united states is we had a huge fear this was cold war time or the tail end of it anyway mm-hmm. we had a huge fear that it would be used against us you know our our great algorithms would be suddenly turned around and we would be a- unable to read the messages we needed to read. We were lucky we were able to, you know, defeat the Enigma machine for World War II. Right. And if we hadn't beaten it, we might, we probably still would have won just due to sheer money and force. But money and force isn't always the perfect solution. Yeah. So we had a fear of encryption. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the Clinton government, number one, uh, made uh, an encryption that had sort of a backdoor in it. Okay. Um, it. It was a key escrow thing, so whenever a key was generated, the key would be encrypted and then sent back to the government somehow. Okay. So gross. Yeah, totally. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think that took off, as you might have guessed. Okay. Yeah, I don't know too much about that because I was like five. Yeah, mm-hmm. we were very young. Mm-hmm. Um, so but, no. So that that leads us nicely into our final topic of the day, which is uh, the subject of government backdoors. Hopefully. Um, so the the gist of this one is that government wants access to the data that companies have that, uh, especially on bad people. No, is right? is that a, is that a good thing to want as a person? Should you want your government to want need and want information on bad people? Um, in general, yes. Yes, in right? general, yeah. I agree. Um, because I think it's a morally right thing to do that you want your government to have the data it needs to do whatever it needs to do to bad people. To yeah, to protect the rest of us, right? Right. Um, and so that's why we have laws around when police can go and gather information from somebody's house because that is usually a you know private protected area. Mm-hmm. Um, but once they have a uh, a legitimate suspicion that this person has been up to no good. They can go in and gather evidence. And now you've you've opened that. on you've opened Pandora's box already. You said legitimate. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's one of the hardest parts. Um. So so in general, the way that it kind of works, and and this this is also the way that I hope that it continues to work right is that um, companies will generally cooperate when there is like a warrant um, or a court order or whatever um, and they and they have access to the data in question right Mm -hmm. Um, so in in cases where like um, google has access to our emails that are stored in gmail um, because the way that like it's not in just encrypted by your password for your google account um I don't think That's, any emails are encrypted, actually. Yeah, probably not. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's not the kind of thing where Google has promised that you and only you will have access to this, the, the data that they have stored on here. Right. Um, so the, the, the controversy actually comes from cases where the companies don't have access to the data and they have promised the, the consumers that, that, that this, is a form of encryption that will be secure even from that company, mm-hmm. right? So uh, a lot of times we're talking about the encryption on the device itself, on the storage that you hold in your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and but but of course, you know, if if the government is doing an investigation, they're going to want that data because right. they're going to want to gather as much of it as they possibly can. Mm-hmm. Um, so. In, in these cases, they will try to get companies to build in backdoors. Right. Um, so you can think of this as like a master key um, that will unlock any of the data 
encrypted using this system. And it's just like that uh, the uh, master keys the TSA allegedly had to unlock your luggage. Right, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, the, the problem with this is even, even if they build it well, e- even if this is something that we're okay with it existing and, they, and they've gone through the, uh, the proper steps to, to make it, right? And it works. And it works. Um, that means that there is one thing, one key that is going to be the object of all attacks. Exactly. You know, everybody who wants to get illegitimate access to and, this data is going to be trying to figure out what that key is. And it, what's even worse is that the attacks that we're talking about, they're not even like technical attacks. It might have, it might be something as simple as, hey, can you open your desk drawer for a minute? I want to want to see what kind of pens you have. Yeah. And then they grab the key. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's and social we, engineering at, at, the, at the easiest levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we have a hilarious chase scene, you know, where they're uh, running around and bouncing off the walls. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so right now, February 21st, 2016, uh, over the last week, there has been kind of a, a skerfuffle. A snafu wow. going on uh, surrounding the the case of um, one of the suspects for the uh, San Bernardino shootings, right? That's mm-hmm. that's the where it was. Yep. Um, and uh, so the phone that he had, uh, which is was, um, Saeed Farouk, I believe. Yep. Yep. Um, so the the phone that he had was uh, an Apple iPhone 5C, right? Something um, like that. That was provided to him by his employer which was ironically the san bernardino county department of public health Mm -hmm. um and he was a public employee yeah uh and so so what's going on right now is the fbi is trying to get access to the information that is stored on the phone Mm -hmm. um and because the iphone is encrypted um they are trying to get apple's help to to get into the system um and they're in this case, they aren't even, they're not asking for like a one key that will unlock all of them. What they're asking for is for Apple to load some custom firmware onto the phone mm-hmm. um, that will get rid of the usual limits of how many times you can like enter a password. Um, because a lot of times, you know, when, when you're, you've entered your password incorrectly five times or so, it'll say like, Oh, okay. You need to wait for like five minutes now. And then, you know, that time will increase. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that makes a brute force attack of just guessing as many things, as many passwords as you possibly can, uh, much less, much less realistic. Right. So my, my understanding is the, uh, the current firmware has a 10 try limit. Okay. And after that, it's just wiped. Wow. I guess. So, cool. Um, and then, even if they were able to not touch that limit, there's an 80 sec- or eighty millisecond initial delay, and then every failed attempt after increases the delay between the you know next input time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it can get kind of long, and apparently they don't like that. And no. so, what, what they're requesting is that Apple have uh, or design somehow some firmware that removes the delay and removes the 10 try limit. Yep. And it has to be Apple that creates this firmware because um, the iPhone, when you're loading new firmware onto it, will check to see if it is signed by Apple. Which basically so. means that it, that it is uh, authenticated and verified that Apple made this somehow. Mm hmm. Using one of the aforementioned uh, cryptographic, which I believe encryption. is uh, two key. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's hard to keep all that straight. So, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Apple uh, is Tim Cook wrote a letter to our customers, um, or a message to our customers, excuse me, um, saying that you know this is a bad thing for the government to ask us for, and we are going to do all that we can to fight that. Um, and most of the tech world uh, ha- is siding with Apple on this one. Um, Sundar, or, I'm sorry, not Sundar, wait. Yeah. Yeah, Sundar Pichai. Mm-hmm. Uh, wait, who's the Microsoft guy? Uh, Satya Nadella. Satya Nadella, okay. Yeah, but Sundar Pichai, uh, CEO of Google, um, tweeted in, in support of Tim Cook. He saying, tweeted. Yeah, okay, he now tweeted. Just step back, think for yourselves. <laughs> Should the either most powerful or second most powerful company in the world 
respond to one of the most nefarious threats in humanity by tweeting? No. The answer is no. It was a total of five tweets, too. Oh, yeah. that doesn't make it better. And and actually, this apparently was the first multi-part tweet that Sundar Pichai has ever done. Unacceptable. Um, yeah. So, so the, the point here is that asking for this kind of thing from a company... Uh, is going to set like a bad precedent because even if in this case it is desirable for the government to have that information and in this case like apple would be in complete control of of what's going on with the Allegedly. iphone because well because like the fbi has to bring the phone to apple's headquarters in order to have them load this thing onto it's true, it true but like yeah. i said allegedly um so so even even though all of the particulars of this case make it like you know you you could you could go okay th- this is all right we we want to do this um it makes it much harder to argue against shady cases later on so so i guess my first thing to think about it is so this year it's it's terrorist attack next year what is it you know it's uh it's just to somebody you know robbing a bank mm-hmm. you know you need to get the data off man then the next year after that, it's what tax is tax it? evasion. It's, it's you know some, yeah. something. It it continues to guess for, get further away from important in uses. And then yeah, the next thing you know, it's uh, we we need this person's location data to see if they were at a protest against the government. Right. Right. You know. You know. It, 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 you know maybe it isn't like that now, but in ten years, who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, you know. So how do we know the FBI in 10 years won't try to somehow reverse engineer whatever Apple makes for them to do yeah, to yeah. do it? You know, we just don't know. Um, I guess the next thing I would think about is, you know, oops, Apple sort of kind of accidentally lost an iPhone in a bar again. Oh, yeah. Like, oops, that's not good. Okay, the next thing I would think about is, so let's say we let the United States have their way with Apple. Cool, great. We're saving ourselves. And now we all have backdoors, and it's wonderful. But now so does everybody else, because Apple isn't just in the United States. Yeah. They have other countries that they do business with. China doesn't even request this from Apple. Yeah, because I... Uh, and there there was a section of an article that was removed from the... Who was it? New York Times? Yep, the New York Times. Uh, 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 regarding this, that uh, part of the reason that, that China doesn't request this kind of thing from companies is because they know that they won't be able to get away with it because nobody else can get away with it. Right. Um, and I, I can't think of a government who would want this kind of thing more than China's government. Exactly. Um, so, so if they see the United States government requesting this from their companies and getting it, uh, it's probably going to encourage them to put a lot of pressure on companies right. to give this kind of thing. And so it's not as if Apple is being requested today to make a backdoor. Mm-hmm. They are just being requested to remove some brute forcing limitations. That's it. And not and that's not to say that we haven't seen backdoors in the past. We had right. uh, the the you know the whole thing uh, that Edward Snowden uh, had to leave the country for was right. because he uh, blew the whistle on Project Prism. Uh, Various I think things. It was, yeah, um, but yeah, that that uh, there were a lot of information companies that were cooperating with the NSA uh, on allowing them to sniff all of this data. Right, and you know, it's one thing when you know there is an unencrypted stream of data going through, and you just happen to save it all, mm-hmm. and totally different when a personal device owned by yourself can be unlocked, not by yourself. Right, and so that that's the definition of the back door. And, uh, you know, so that, that's a totally different kind of scenario and case. And uh, it's just not a good idea. Yeah. But yeah. but so now I, I've talked to quite a few people about this because I, I, um, I wrote my paper about it because I thought it was such a great thing to write about. Uh, encryption is very important to me and, and personal security I don't care about. But security <laughs> of the world is much more important. Sure. You know, I, you're I, so altruistic. Yeah, I'm thinking about everybody here. So I don't. I, I mean, I don't care. I don't have any data. I hate files. Yeah. But for everybody else, you know, it's important to keep in mind. So when I ask somebody, you know, so why do you think they should have access, and they, as in the FBI, should have access to this phone? They should intentionally weaken security of of this phone, which could very easily lead in a cascading way to the weakened security of everyone. Mm-hmm. What reasoning do you have? And so you know, they say, well, I don't have anything to hide. But, uh, you know, that terrorist totally does. Well, you know, okay, so give me your credit card number. And they say no. Yeah. And it's like, what now? 
Okay. And then, you know, we go on and like, so well, what if Russia requested this of Apple? And they're like, well, no, no, Russia would never do that. And it's like, are you sure? <laughs> Russia would love to do that. Um, you know, what happens when the KGB needs it or, you know, some... Uh, what happens when uh, the, you know, the American... I mean, so as a as a very liberal person, I love the government. I love having big bureaucracy, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. But what happens when the government kind of turns sour, right? Right, exactly, is, which know, it does. Yeah, exactly. It, it, I mean, we're, we live in a democracy. It changes hands all the time. Mm-hmm. Who knows who's going to be in power in the future and what's going to happen? Right, how so, can we trust the future? Yeah, there who knows yeah who's going to inherit these systems that we've right, built exactly and so like you know now it might be okay to have encryption that's strong and and if if in the future encryption is outlawed then who has the encryption the outlaws mm-hmm. so does it really matter in the long run for them so it doesn't it doesn't stop terrorists from using encryption because they'll just use a phone that has encryption that and then normal people won't have encryption so it doesn't help the United States to weaken it intentionally. Yeah, it just makes it worse for normal people. And this, this uh, any of my students who are listening to this might notice some parallels to the discussion that we had about DRM uh, mm-hmm. er- earlier in class. Um, and in in particular, actually, encryption was one of the forms of DRM. But you know, oh, yeah, um, yeah, is is uh, it's it's not it's not going to make it harder for the bad people. Right. It's just going to make it harder for the people who are legitimately trying to live their lives mm-hmm. uh, according to the law. Exactly. Right? And, and you know, it's very hard for when, when passionate people are, when they hear terrorism, they, you know, ring their alarm bells and become one way. Mm-hmm. And that's it. They can't think of an alternative problem that this could cause. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's fine. We just have to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. Don't. Just just call call your senators. Tell them to yell at the FBI. Come and sign this online petition that we have. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, totally. That's so useful, right? Uh, I'd like to dream that it is. It's not. Because oh. it's encrypted. Or is it? Is How do we know that these people are the people who are signing them? We don't. Because oh. you only have to type in your email address. Yeah. That's secure. Uh, all right. So yeah. I, I think we've pretty much exhausted this subject. It is a good topic. subject. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, so Ryan, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, especially on the Twitter at https colon slash slash twitter.com slash Ryanamar. <laughs> and at a newly revamped. Oh, yes. I do have a newly revamped website that's not in https in any way you can visit that at http colon slash slash ryan and that's it you just go there and uh it has a fancy ribbon and 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 you click it and it moves so if you see that ribbon chances are it hasn't been altered well i mean it kind of alters itself but you know what i mean right yeah uh, and you can find me, Ian R. Buck, uh, as Ian R. Buck, uh, on Twitter, on on uh, Flickr, on... Actually, on, I think on YouTube I'm still Ian Buck. Well, I don't know. Anyway, it's okay. Uh, but uh, also, if you if you like the stuff that I make, uh, if you find these podcasts helpful, uh, I, would li- I would really appreciate it if you went to my Patreon and considered uh, uh, supporting me financially in my creative endeavors. And uh, since this is the extra dimension, uh, the the kind of wild card subject show on, uh, here on the Nexus, if you, the listener, have a, a topic that you think that we should cover, or if you want to help us cover it and come uh, on the on the show yourself, uh, get in contact with us. Hit that contact button uh, over on the right side of the page, um, or on the bottom of the page if you are on a mobile device. <laughs> um, it should be right underneath the pictures you of us. What? To mess with you in the future, it's going to be on the left. Oh, man. I hate you so much. Uh, So thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, stay encrypted. Yep. Have a good one.